Welcome to the Center for Independent Studies. My name is Oliver Hartwig. I'm a research fellow here in the economics program at the center. And today we have a very special guest here. We have perhaps the world authority on the economics of religion, Professor Larry Ayakunin. Welcome to the center. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, as I said, the world expert in a field of economics that is perhaps not that well known, but you have widely published in the Journal of Political Economy the American Journal of Sociology, the Journal of the Scientific Study of Religion, but you are an economist, and economists do not actually deal that often with religious questions, is that right? Well, it is true that there are not that many economists working on religion yet, uh, but what is less well understood and appreciated in the general public is that economists have, for many decades now, uh, done much of their best work on the boundaries between economics and other social sciences, economics of the family, economics of uh, addiction, and so on. So in some sense, this is an extension of uh, this broad program of applying economic ideas and methods to non-market behavior. So with that, I think it is already quite clear what economics of religion is not. It's not religious economics. It's not um, dealing with Sharia law, Muslim ideas of finance, or Catholic uh, social teaching, it is really genuine economics. Yes. Uh, in, in some sense, what uh, you are referring to as religious economics and the economics of religion are mirror images of each other. They don't necessarily conflict, but they really are very different. Somebody who wants to use a religious authority, whether it's the Bible, uh, or, or the works of Islam to understand or to argue about uh, what is the optimal way to organize a society or banking or taxation. That's very, very different uh, f from the work of an economist of religion who's simply trying to take the methods and perspective of economics to understand the place of religion in society. And most certainly, it's different in that the economist of religion is not trying to push any particular religious perspective or irreligion. Uh, that's important to keep in mind. And that also then means that when it comes to the economics of religion, there are probably Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Muslims and atheists and agnostics working in that field? No, that's quite true. There is now an association for the study of religion, economics, and culture. And uh, it is well populated by people in all of those, those groups and perhaps several more. Working people. peacefully together, I presume? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and uh, what they share is a real commitment both to believing that the role, the place of religion in society is too important to ignore and a commitment to using the methods of social science and economics in particular objectively, seriously, to see where it, where it leads them. So basically, it is just a new kind of um, economic subdiscipline. All of the subdisciplines that were started uh, by Gary Becker in, at the University of Chicago, and I think, I gather, you, you actually did your PhD under Gary Becker and George Stiegler, I think. That's correct. And um, they were looking at the economics of suicide and marriage and love and uh, Religion is just another extension of that field of really extending the, the scope of economics, basically. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, Gary Becker and, and many other economists have radically expanded the domain of what we think of as, as economics. And what they uh, pointed out, and what Gary Becker has emphasized, is that the heart of the economic approach is not the study of money or commerce, but rather the study of human action particularly emphasizing three things. Uh, one of them is maximizing choice, or rational choice. Uh, another is uh, thinking uh, about or emphasizing the stability of, of, of preferences. So we don't just assume that if somebody changes their behavior, it's because their ideas or their preferences changed. We look for changes in prices, income, changes in the conditions surrounding them. And the third was the emphasis on market equilibrium, thinking about uh, how when you aggregate up individual actions and when you especially think about it as a marketplace, you can make sense mm. of what's happening. Just to take it back a step into history, um, the economics of religion, uh, as I said before, is a relatively new field. I think you were one of the first to actually write a, a PhD thesis in the field, but it's not a, quite a new idea. You actually mentioned in the talk we had earlier that uh, some early ideas about the economics of religion can be found even in Adam Smith. Yes, in fact, Adam Smith has an entire chapter in The Wealth of Nations on religious institutions. And what he emphasizes, perhaps not surprisingly, is that 
how a religious institution is financed it makes all the difference in the world, and in particular, what its relationship to the government is. And Adam Smith basically said, although he didn't use exactly these words, we should think about the religious marketplace as having being governed by the same kind of forces that govern other, other marketplaces. And in particular, we should recognize that the effect of monopoly is, if anything, more pernicious in the realm of religion than elsewhere. And that the uh, that on the other extreme, laissez-faire religion can be a very good thing in that it, it, it motivates the suppliers of religion, the clergy, to really focus on the needs of the people and supply a wide range of religious products. Now, these aren't exactly Adam Smith's words, but these are fundamentally his ideas. Mm -hmm. And he, in particular, at that point, was critiquing uh, the state or the established churches like the, the Church of England uh, or uh, Scandinavian Lutheran churches, which basically had turned religion into a branch of government and their jobs into those of civil, s civil servants. And uh, sadly, uh, when you turn a job into civil service, you get uh, about as much enthusiasm uh, out of uh, your clergy as you do out of your post office officials. So you're saying basically that there is a market for products, there is a market for cars, for toothpaste, there is a market for ideas, and there is a market for religions basically as well. Yes. Uh, the concept of market is uh, in economics a very broad thing. If you have people who want something and you have other people who are willing to supply it, uh, you will have markets. But how do religions in these markets compete? I mean, on the one hand, if we go back into history, you have extremely violent clashes between religions, but you, I think, argue that in modern Western society, at least, this kind of competition is actually quite peaceful and very productive because it strengthens these individual yeah. churches. Uh, again, I have to uh, admit that I'm leaning on, on uh, ideas that go back as uh, far as uh, Adam Smith and David Hume. Uh, religious extremism concern about uh, violent competition is, is nothing new, nor is the, the fact of extremism and violence new to the world. The question is, what do you do about it? Uh, and Adam Smith's point, which seems to have been very well validated by American history, but also the history of, of the West in the last 100, 200 years, his point was that if you allow the religious marketplace to, to blossom, if you, if you uh, keep the government's hands off, there are going to be hundreds, even thousands of competing religions, each of which is quite small, each of which is forced, not, not by virtue of theology, but by the market realities, to exist and coexist with all the other religions. And so civility, peacefulness, comes as a byproduct of competition and pluralism. And the competition also improves the product. Yes. Uh, again, you have to be careful that what you say mean when you talk about improvement of the religious product is the same kind of improvement you mean in anything else. It's addressing people's needs. Whether or not it, it you know, represents the divine truth is, is not for economists, uh, certainly, to argue. But the simple fact is that in a free market, in a religiously free market, just like a free market for automobiles, if you produce a product that is inferior or is perceived as not addressing people's needs, you will fail. And in the American, as well as now worldwide religious marketplace, you will not have any followers if you insist on preaching, teaching, and demanding things that don't meet people's needs. And I think what you mean is the uh, differentiation of, of um, state churches in Europe, like the Church of England, but also um, taxpayer-funded churches like the Church in Germany, for example. And you compare that to the free market of um, America, where churches actually have to well, really compete for uh, their believers and where they have to offer them a service that they actually value and appreciate. Yes, and this is something that uh, Europeans were especially aware of in the early 1800s. People like de Tocqueville and others came to the U.S. and they were stunned by uh, two things. One was the breadth and richness of American civil society. That is, the functions that were being performed by what you might call the private sector, by communities outside of, of government. They also were stunned, and they realized these were linked, by how many of these functions were rooted in religions. So people were using religion uh, or religious communities, or the religious, or to say it in a somewhat perhaps more dignified way, religious communities in America were addressing a full range of people's needs. 
uh, not just worrying about or thinking about you know, theology and, uh, and whether or not you were going to go to heaven, but also trying to address the problems of, of poverty or health uh, or, or any other uh, needs that might arise at the so local community. The, the church is where, where basically the kind of a welfare state that we have today. Yes, they were the principal providers of social welfare. So has the um, welfare state in, in that sense, perhaps in, in Western European societies, crowded out religious I don't think activity. there's much doubt of it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's some very good published uh, statistical work on this, which uh, strongly suggests that one of the reasons why Europe is be has become so secular is that the functions, the traditional functions of government, of, excuse me, of religion, have been taken over progressively by the welfare state. Hmm. So it's been taken over by a monopoly provider of these services, whereas previously they were provided by lots of smaller uh, Yes, organizations. Or, or sometimes even very large ones like the Catholic Church. Mm. But uh, yes, you can crowd religion out, or you, especially the social services, if you create a free publicly, that is to say, tax-financed education system, people aren't nearly as willing to pay a local church to mm. provide education for their children. Mm. Now I know that you have um, a lot of research into religious extremism, and I think we first need to define what we really mean by extremism. You don't mean militant extremism, you just mean a, a special degree of commitment to the ideals and values of the church. Yeah, I think that it's care you have to be very careful to think about and realize that religious extremism, whether violent or nonviolent, uh, can be studied as this phenomenon of people being extremely committed to, very involved in their religion, and in most cases it uh, does not produce any violence at all. Okay, but the economist would look at these um, religious extremists and ask, well, what kind of utility are they actually getting out of these activities? So what does the economist, economist has to have to say about religious extremism then? Okay, well I have to start by pointing out that here, again, economist perspective is quite different from that of other people, psychologists, sociologists, and, and you know, the run-of-the-mill citizen. The normal response is to see somebody who is extremely committed to a belief system, especially one that deviates from the social norm as crazy, uh, as indoctrinated, as somehow deeply deviant. What economists have, uh, have helped uh, other people appreciate is that m extremists are, for the most part, and, and this, this is clear no matter how you study them, whether you give them psychological tests or you just look at their history, they're normal people with normal wants. And uh, what draws them to these religions tends to be the fact that they find in them answers to and the provision of goods and services and needs that are that other people uh, that, that are shared throughout society. So believers are behaving rationally. They, uh, I can't say this strongly enough, we now have decades of research on seeming on, on deviant groups in which we find that the overwhelming majority of members are normal psychologically, socially, healthy, mentally. Uh, it is simply remarkable how badly the old theories of, uh, of psychopathology are when it comes to extremism. If you want to understand extremists, even suicide bombers, the last thing you should do is start by thinking they must be crazy. Mm. So, so what are they getting out of it? Uh, well, what they're getting out of, uh, and, and le let me choose an example, so instead of speaking so vaguely, the, uh, the Mormon church the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in, in the United States and much of the world can rightly be called an extreme or deviant religion in that they hold beliefs that deviate substantially from other groups and they expect a very high level of commitment from their members. So in that sense they're an extremist or a deviant religion. Uh, sociologists and, and other social scientists would call them a sect or a sect movement. But when you look at these members uh, psychologically, they're, they're quite normal, healthy. What are they getting out of their religion? They're getting friendship. They're getting social interactions. They're getting uh, help and support. They're getting venues in which their children are, are socialized and ra you know, given, given values. And in places, and if they happen to be relatively poor or disadvantaged, they're getting economic help. Uh, they're getting, you see this especially with immigrant groups, they're getting help attaining literacy and joining the, the mainstream of their culture. This happens in the United States and as I understand it also in Australia. Uh, uh, immigrants to this, this country uh, are 
often extremely devout and involved in very small, intense religious groups, in no small part because those groups aren't just delivering pie in the sky, but also, you know, a cake on bread on the table, so to speak. Mm. They're actually helping people with their their everyday economic and social needs. So is it true then that if you are poorer and more marginalized, you actually gain more out of your involvement with religious activity then? Uh, to some extent, yes. Mm. And uh, there's no question that people who are marginalized often find religion is a very valuable component of their life. And would you say then that this kind of marginalization leads or could drive to extremism? When you think of um, not American churches, but for example, the Taliban now? Yeah, uh, I, I have to say sort of yes and no. Yes, uh, I think it is very important when you try to, what, to understand Islamic extremism and other forms of militant extremism across the world. You have to understand that people are drawn to these movements because they are providing them with goods and services that the broader society doesn't provide. But you also have to recognize that the fault here isn't really with the ideology, but rather with the social and political environment. You've got environments in which the economies basically don't function, uh, that uh, private enterprise is, is scarcely exists and in which political freedom scarcely exists. There is no good way to, to organize yourself collectively uh, or, or obtain these services except through religious organizations. So you have failed states and the vacuum that this failed state leaves is filled. Right, and that in itself doesn't guarantee or cause militancy. Mm. What causes the militancy, I think, more than anything else is a perverse relationship between church and state. When the government chooses winners and losers, when the government, inv when the government supports one religion and ruthlessly suppresses other, it's a guarantee for, for religious violence and militancy. Or where the government is so illegitimate that people are going to want revolution, then they will of course look to whatever means, religion uh, and religious organizations are often one of the best, They'll look to those means to overthrow an illegitimate government. You have all of that going on in Afghanistan and throughout the Middle East. Mm. One of the aspects of the study of um, religion, the economic study of religion, that I find really fascinating is that you can then take your insights gained from the study of religion and apply it to other group phenomena. And I think uh, you mentioned in a talk that I listened to earlier, um, for example, football clubs, and you say to non-religious people that if you really want to understand how religious people tick, you just have to attend a football match, is that right? Yes, and I think this is valuable, uh, especially if your background is, is irreligious or secular. You might uh, find religious commitment, uh, you, know, you, just, you can't believe that, it, that it's normal, and you find it kind of perverse. But almost everybody belongs to something or cares deeply about something. And uh, from my understanding, uh, based on my com you know, conversations with Australians, that uh, sport uh, is for many of them more of a religion than religion is. And it, it provides them a sense of identity, uh, a sense of something that they, that, you know, they feel uh, they can feel very right about, and they can organize themselves as groups are around. There's a wide range of these that uh, of, of these phenomena. Brings us back to um, a common saying that when people stop believing in God, it's not that they, they believe in nothing; they believe in anything. Yeah. So that anything could be anything really, from sport to fascism to environmentalism, right? Yeah, and uh, again, it's not just a matter of beliefs; it's social organizations. Uh, economists talk about clubs, but they mean much more than just the typical social clubs. Uh, you know, all of the, the most valuable things that we can produce basically must be produced in groups. And religion is, are just one of the kinds of groups in which we produce the most valuable things. And we see this, so yes, in environmentalism and political movements in social uh, movements uh, all across the spectrum. So what are the religious services that uh, environmentalism provides? Well, most uh, especially, it provides you with some sort of transcendent cause. You're a sense that you're, you're a part of something much bigger than yourself. It provides, uh, it satisfies this deep need that all humans seem to have to feel that they're engaged in a, in a moral action, something that really makes a difference. And frankly, uh, a lot of the actions of environmentalists or environmentally oriented actions. Uh, require a real leap of faith to believe that they're really changing the world. And in the U.S. right now, people get quite 
uh, worked up about whether or not you're, you're using plastic bags uh, at a grocery store. It's hard to understand how my use of plastic bags are going to change the world. But then again, uh, it's hard to understand how uh, somebody's prayer is going to change the world. People find in the environmental movement uh, a, the answers to many of the same kind of needs that they more traditionally found in religion. And it's not just the needs and values, it's also that it structures your day and your week. I mean, there are so many rituals. Um, I mean, Catholics uh, pray at least in the morning and uh, at night, and environmentalists switch off the lights when they leave the room to save energy, right? It's, it's these little things where you can actually see it structures a day and it gives your everyday life more meaning, is that right? It does that, and I always have to emphasize that the power of a religion is rooted usually, almost always, in its social setting, its collectivity. An environmentalist signals to other people in very obvious ways, though some... Uh, so you're a better person when you recycle your rubbish. A, I'm driving a Prius, you're driving a gas hog. Uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm using recycling my, uh, I'm recycling my grocery bags, you're using plastic bags. But uh, I can donate to some organization and I get the same um, spiritual uh, yeah, feeling the, uh, about that. I, I can't uh, emphasize this enough, because especially for the sake of people who aren't the least bit religious, that within environmentalism and, and other movements, people uh, find the, you know, the same needs answered. And I think you would even see the same kind of church structure within the broad church of environmentalism. You would see sects and you would see mainstream organizations. Yes, right? yes. Uh, again, I'll use the American uh, ex examples that I know best. Sierra Club is our, our uh, mainline church. You, so you, Sierra Club would be the Church of England. Yes, It yes. doesn't require much and it makes you feel better. That's right. You make a small donation, they give you a, you, you know, you pay for, a, you pay a little money, you get a, a pretty calendar, you become a card-carrying member, and that's about it. Then you can join Greenpeace, it's a much more serious commitment, and, uh, much more, and uh, what you think of as a more sectarian organization. And then still more extreme, Earth First and other organizations that are engaged in illegal uh, and often actual terrorist acts. Uh, there's frankly, I think, uh, more militant extremism in the uh, extreme wings of the environmental movement in the U.S. today than in any religious uh, groups I'm aware of. Have you discussed your ideas about environmentalism as a religion with environmentalism? How do they respond to that? Well, they respond about as well as uh, Catholics do if you uh, argued with them about their most deeply held uh, beliefs. In fact, uh, I'll go a step further. Uh, throughout most of uh, the West, uh, people have learned that to accept difference in religion, to accept that you might be a devout Catholic, I might be a devout Jew, uh, someone else might be a devout Protestant, somehow we have to all get along. But within uh, the environmental movement, that, that level of acceptance isn't there. Uh, and so, uh, in some sense, uh, the environmental movement is a religion that hasn't yet learned to live in a pluralistic environment. Well, but we are less accepting uh, of religious views in society these days, but we are very tolerant. Well, actually, we impose these environmentalist views on society, and we actually require them. We teach them in schools. Yes, yes. Well, this is, this is, the, uh, this is the trap that Adam Smith was talking about centuries ago, that uh, I take my most deeply held values, and it's not enough that I just accept them and live by them or try to raise my children or preach. I'm a great fan of preaching of all kinds. That's basically what all academics do. Go the next step. I use the coercive power of government. I use the power of the sword to impose that on other people. And that, frankly, I think is a very dangerous and generally very unhealthy thing. Well, thank you very much. It was all very fascinating. And I think uh, well, we look forward to your future research and um, we are curious where it will take you. And uh, thank you very much to, for sharing your time here at the Center for Independent Studies. And thank you very much for watching this interview. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.